is Nina G and this is the comedy time capsule and today is June 11th and today Marga Gomez is joining me hello how are you hello darling I am uh, I'm good it's so nice to see you I wish this you know was more uh, three-dimensional but uh, I wish to but let me ask you this can you say when you started comedy and why? Um, I started comedy uh, because I loved comedy. I loved watching it. And my father was a comedian. He's, he's passed. Both my parents have passed. But um, I was the only child of their marriage. Uh, they, they were married for 12 years, which is 11 years too long. <laughs> so they stayed together for me because they wanted me to need therapy as an adult. But um, my, my father was, uh, I mean, both my parents, you know, they had reasons for what they did. Uh, but, the, you know, they love me in their own way. You know, you think sometimes, well, some people think sometimes, oh, my parents were this and that. But then, you know, it gets worse. <laughs> so my dad... Um, you know, he loved me. Both my parents, again, uh, were bitches, self-involved, show people. Uh, my mother was a dancer. And my father was, um, he also uh, put shows together, which I love to do. He was an a impresario and a comedian and, and all these other things he would do. Uh, so I was always watching him. And I was watching how people... Um, this, this was the emerging Latino population in New York in the 60s, how, how he helped people get through another day of working shit jobs or, or being hungry or whatever. They, you know, the shows were cheap then and he would host these variety shows. And I just thought that is the greatest thing in the world and the attention he got. And then I, uh, I always had that love, but I was, uh, I was a Latina who who was assimilated. I, I went to a uh, Catholic school just for a few years, just enough to destroy my self-esteem. Oh, and then yeah, that's too. <laughs> exact same. Right, right, yeah. And uh, that's why we're so cooperative and we started this on time. Um, but, um, but the nuns, you know, they made me not speak Spanish and they made me think that, you know, being Irish is the best thing. You know, I can jig, but I can't salsa. So as, as I got older, I decided that I wanted to write. I didn't even think of performing. And it kind of went on, you know, I went to college, got into drugs, quit college, moved to San Francisco where there was this uh, alternative art scene. And, uh, and the stand-up comedy was, was, was like, the stand-up comedy, stand comedy um, as we know it now was beginning in the 80s. This is when Robin was starting at the Holy City Zoo and the other cafe and Ellen DeGeneres was, you know, uh, performing in the closet, but performing. And so, you know, I would get up on those open mics and I wasn't very good and they put me on late and I perform for uh, tables and chairs and the waitress who was cleaning up and... Uh, and then this club opened uh, that was uh, a gay comedy club or gay cabaret. It was called the Valencia Rose. And it's on uh, uh, Valencia. It was on, you know, Valencia and 18th. I think there's a, uh, a, a millennial bicycle shop there now. You know? and, uh, and then it was like you were encouraged to be out. And I was sort of dabbling with being in the closet. But then when I went, to this place and I did 10 minutes at their open mic and for an audience that was out or allies. And I realized I just, I don't want to censor or edit anything about myself. And I discovered that my performance style is, is very personal. I mean, you know, yes, I'm a lesbian. Yes, I'm Latina, but I'm neurotic first. So, um, yeah. So I, I got started there and, uh, and, and then I, I started making a living um, as sort of this alternative 
uh, queer stand-up comedian uh, with Latino uh, audiences. And, uh, and that's basically how it started. My love of comedy, the influence of my father, and then being in San Francisco at the right time. And so you got here when to San Francisco? I got here in the 80s. I started, you know, that's when the comedy... Uh, the, you know, the, the other cafe and the hate yep. and uh, the Holy City Zoo. It's like when they were thriving and things and everybody was looking to San Francisco to find out, you know, who they're going to put, you know, in their sitcom and all this. Yeah, no, and I think because um, I used to watch the Channel 9 P PBS. Yes. Had comedy to, to tonight. Did I see you on that or did I see you on something else? <laughs> You, you saw me on that with an unfortunate hairdo. Well, <laughs> I mean, everyone did. I mean, that, very yeah. large padded shoulders. Yes. <laughs> yeah. No. Okay. So I, I want to make sure Goldberg. Uh, just a fun fact. Whoopi Goldberg was the host and she was already famous because she had already brought her one person show to New York was discovered by Mike Nichols. And then it was, you know, uh, and then ghost. Uh, mm -hmm. But she, uh, they, you know, they brought her back because she had her roots in San Francisco. She was always not a stand-up, you know, uh, technically, she was a, a, a comedic performer, and she was a storyteller. And, uh, and so her, she started out in the East Bay with, uh, oh gosh, I forget the name of the company. And then she started performing, also workshopping at the Valencia Rose. So that's where I met her. And oh. I remember before she got real famous, she said, we got to workshop sometime. And I said, definitely. And she gave me her number and I took my sweet ass time to call and it was too late. <laughs> and then number she famous on you, huh? <laughs> yeah. But when she hosted the show, I was very intimidated because I was uh, performing with, uh, you know, the, the comedians who were, you know, the men, uh, you know, uh, white guys. And uh, I felt very, uh, just so intimidated, so shy. And I, I was, I, I remember like, you know, you had the green room and I was just, I was hiding in a hallway or the bathroom or something. I was just, I was afraid they'd, you know, put me down or, or, or mess with my head, you know, yeah. you know how comics are. The and then uh, when I went, went back into the green room, the dudes were going, oh, Whoopi was looking for you because <laughs> she remembered me. And it's like, yeah, that's right. I am. Mm -hmm. I'm worthy. Yeah. yeah. Well, and um, so it sounds like there were like these two parallel tracks in San Francisco then. Was it kind of like this? it's the mainstream um, and then the queer track? Was that kind of what comedy was then? And, and I'm sure there were other tracks too, because I'm sure Oakland ha had something going on too. So, yeah, I didn't, uh, I, I mostly, you know, did San Francisco, you know, I, I tried the, the comedy competition. I think I came in next to last and I felt that was a win because mm -hmm. I wasn't, I wasn't last. Um, but, but it really was, you know, it was very much white male dominated. Um, you know, <laughs> not a lot has changed, but there wasn't any diversity, you know, it was mm -hmm. just the same guys. And, and some of the guys were, you know, we're, we're, we're very, we're all right. You know, Will Durst, uh, Mark Marin, uh, you know, people coming through, uh, Bobcat and, you know, there were some cool guys, but then there were just some guys who, you know, part of their reason to be a comedian was to put women down it's and to put dead. minorities yeah. down. So that was one track. That was the track that you would always see headlining, um, at the, uh, you know, it was punchline Cobbs, whatever. And then there was the, you know, the alternative and the, uh, the underground, the counterculture. I guess mm -hmm. that's what I was part of, the counterculture, because it wasn't just queer. My audience was also in the Latino community where there was, you know, a progressive community where everyone was trying to find the commonality uh, of being pushed out of the mainstream. Mm -hmm. uh, there was the feminist community. So, so I sort of worked in, in, in these areas and I wound up actually earning a living probably before uh, a, a lot of people who went through the conventional mainstream uh, because there were, uh, there were presenters 
who were uh, presenting for these communities. And so mm-hmm. I was, you know, always on the short list. Yeah. Okay. And so, and Josie's Juice Joint, was that something you ran or did you, because I remember I, I'm 46 and from the Bay Area and like, there's always like, oh, I'm going to go to these places as soon as I turn 18. Um, <laughs> Was that all part of that? Because I remember that being a, a pretty active place or it could have just been for a week or two. I don't know. Oh, uh, so what happened was that the Valencia Rose uh, was run by uh, two, two guys who, who passed, uh, Ron Lanza and Hank Wilson. Uh, they're the ones who got the idea. They were gay school teachers. And, you know, teachers are performers, right? I mean, that's because I wanted to be a school teacher. That's what I thought I was going to be before I uh, got into comedy. Um, and they, um, they were very active in uh, protecting the rights of gay school teachers, increasing visibility. And Tom Amiano, uh, mm-hmm. I'm not sure if he, right, he went on into politics. He was, he's, you know, he's actually been called the mother of gay comedy. He wanted to do comedy. And so they kind of, I think, created this club because they wanted to give Tom uh, a, a platform as a comedian. And also they wanted to encourage, um, you know, queer performance um, and our allies, queer and progressive performance, because uh, so, so the Valencia Rose went on for a few years. Then there was some sort of, I don't know, some sort of business problems. They shut their doors, but the same people pretty much found another location, which was in the Castro. Uh, used to be a pen company, and it's. I'm trying to think of what's there now. Oh well, nothing's nothing's anywhere now. But it turned into this. Uh, it's like a little restaurant that was there with a patio. Uh, it was across from what the cafe floor was, and that was that was Josie's. Margaret Cho, um, that's where she got started as a comedian because she always had an affinity with, uh, for gay audiences. Um, and so we all started uh, performing there, and because it was not just uh, stand-up, uh, I wound up doing a couple of my one-person shows there uh, as well. It was, it was really sweet, you know? Mm-hmm. And so you've been doing one person shows um, in one form or another for a long time then. I started in, uh, so I started uh, basically uh, doing stand up in the 80s, uh, you know, failing at the open mics because I, I was holding something back. I was holding back that I was gay. Add to that that the climate was not favorable for women and brown people. And then, and then besides that, I was just hiding who I was. Uh, I was, you know, I just wasn't using my voice. Uh, so, sorry, what was the question again? Um, oh, I know. I remember. Yeah. I got it. I got it. <laughs> Edit that. Um, when did I start doing one-person shows? So I started with the stand-up. I wound up uh, in a theater troupe called Culture Clash that has gone on to do amazing things. Somehow, I got this uh, email from a University of San Diego that was doing a solo performer uh, uh, festival with Anna DeVere Smith and some other people who are very notable in the field. And somehow, they heard that I did one-person shows. And I'd just been doing stand-up, but I met someone uh, Josh Kornbluth, who's quite well known in in the solo performance world and in, in general performance, and he was doing stand up. He, he just was new in town from Boston, and he was very frustrated uh, in the stand up clubs because, you know, it it was at the time it was just all about laughs per minute. You couldn't really tell a story, and he wanted to talk about he wanted to tell stories. He wanted to talk about his life and all this. So right about that time in the 90s, a place called The Marsh opened up. And, 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 I, and I got this call. I can't remember what happened first, but just to, just to make this more seamless, I got this call. I, I knew, I'm sorry, I don't know what, what's happening. That, that is me. That oh, is okay. Me. I'm getting emails and I'm going to oh, go ahead okay. and do that. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so I got this email and um, I guess I, had, I was already 
connected with Josh and and I said, Josh, I got this email. They want me to be in this festival. Um, I want to talk about my mom because my mom, who'd been like this real babe, this real femme fatale uh, showgirl, um, and, and she really didn't, you know, we had a very strained relationship because, you know, I was, you know, so boyish, so masculine. Um, and then she got sick. She got um, early onset Alzheimer's. And I was trying to be a comedian and I was so... Uh, yeah, I was in grief because that's Alzheimer's, you know, it's like you grieve while they're alive. And it was very hard for me to, you know, hang out in the stand up scene and, and just have this, this pain. And I, I didn't know how to handle it. And uh, so when I got the call from this theater festival, I said, yes, I, I am a solo performer and I, and I, and I'm doing a piece about my mother and I hadn't written one word, uh, but they booked me. And then I real quickly in a month, put this show together. Uh, first, uh, first stage was the marsh. I worked with a uh, David Ford who works with a lot of solo performers and I did it and it worked out. Okay. And then the marsh booked me uh, uh, to do the show in San Francisco. And I, I was worried because although pretty much all my solo pieces can be emotional and poignant and, and can make people cry at points, they also use a lot of comedy along the way. But I was afraid that my audience, uh, my stand-up audience, would freak out like I would be sucker punching them to suddenly bring them, you know, they buy their tickets and suddenly, you know, they're sad. But it was... It was this, you know, really well received. And then it went to the public theater in New York. So I opened off Broadway, got, you know, got all these reviews in the Times and Variety and so on. And, and that launched me into uh, the, uh, I'll call it the uh, L.A. Uh, part of my life. And so, I, can you say more about that? Yes. Uh, I, was just, I was just like worried that I was really, I tend to answer like, really long so i uh but and i um, encourage you to answer really long so go for it every time okay good oh thank you and also i feel like i just got another question so boom next question um what was the la part of my life i did this so okay so i accidentally got booked for a solo festival wound up uh being a real solo performer opened off broadway got reviews and uh these reviews got me a manager from LA who had been uh, Lily Tomlin's manager, uh, who had been, uh, uh, she was even Andrew Dice Clay's manager, which she, she didn't enjoy that time. But she was, she was like one of those salty, uh, legend LA manager types. And she was very much a feminist and, and queer, and she just really wanted to work with women solo performers. So... I wound up getting uh, this show in LA and the room, it was the worst audience in the world because the entire audience was made up of people from CAA, William Morris, and there was all agents. And I thought, what's happening here? I didn't, I haven't heard any human response and they're just all watching me figuring out, can we make money? Money, 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 money. It, it was horrible. Agents are the worst. And uh, although I, I still would like an agent. If, <laughs> um, and and uh, so I, um, I wound up with uh, CAA, uh, which was a big mistake because they, they only know how to handle stars. But there was this lesbian agent in CAA and she didn't, they basically didn't want anybody else to have me. And so I went with them when going with a smaller agency might have, uh, but you know, what, I might own a property what year now. was that? What year was that? Was that in the nineties? This was, yeah, this was about 93 or 94. Mm -hmm. Uh, when the, you know, the feeding frenzy happened when I was like the flavor of the month. And so I wound up moving to LA and living there, uh, in 96. I, I, uh, not even through CAA did I get a part in this movie, uh, but I got uh, a part in my in two Hollywood movies, uh, and one is the one that 
uh, is the funniest one. It's called Sphere. And uh, that's a uh, Warner Brothers film about um, this underwater habitat. I play a uh, uh, military personnel named Jane Edmonds. And uh, it's just a two two person set up here underwater. It's me and Queen Latifah and her, <laughs> and her character's name was Teeny Fletcher. She was not, never would be Teeny. Uh, and the two of us die in the first half hour of Sphere. And the movie flopped so badly that my agency basically dropped me as if like I directed it as if I wrote the screenplay, but that's the way these agencies are. But that know. works. Yeah. yeah. Um, it, how, how did you find, cause I know, you know, in doing comedy, there's like different styles in different types. How did you find either agents or people or venues that were so accommodating to how you did comedy? Um, well, I had to wait till I left Los Angeles because mm -hmm. I couldn't really do comedy at the clubs uh, uh, because I don't, I don't know how to drive. I can't drive. And if you can't drive, you can't do shit in LA. So my manager would have to drive me places and, um, you know, I think she had a, I think she had a crush on me. And so it, it just was all, so by the time I get to the place, I felt like weird. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So, um, so that was kind of, uh, as far as my stand up time, uh, it, it, it was a, it was a dormant, it was dormant. Uh, I did write a, a solo show though, based on LA, my time in LA called Jay Walker. Uh, and it was about being a pedestrian in LA and, uh, and it ends with, uh, Jennifer Lopez getting run over. Uh, it was one, of, it was one more of one of my san uh, fantasy plays. I was going to say sanity. Uh, I guess it was a sanity to write it. <laughs> and then once I, uh, I think once I wrote it, I started making inroads into moving to New York, uh, because I realized that my agency hadn't told me that they dropped me. Um, they don't make an announcement or send, you know, it's just wow. like, because in case, so uh, I just said, hey, you know, you haven't sent me out for anything lately. And, uh, and then my agent, uh, she goes, oh yeah, you know, I was having a talk with Gloria Estefan about the same thing. It's like, what? She says, you know, there's a shift. This is how old I am. This was when uh, Matt Damon and uh, Ben Affleck uh, we're like the thing. Um, and so she said, there's just a cultural shift. So basically, I think she was just telling me I, I was too old or whatever for things. It's like, well, thank you. Mm -hmm. And then I quit my manager and I quit LA and I just, I just jumped ship to, uh, to New York. Uh, and I was so, and I, you know, cut, I had, I had long, uh, I had long actress hair, like, like yours, Nina. <laughs> <laughs> So I could play that attorney. <laughs> um, and um, yeah, so I, so I went to New York and then I just, you know, I just you know, went wild. Um, I, you know, I started playing, playing clubs again. And there was a real rad queer uh, movement. So, uh, there, you know, I, I just started playing like smoky, smoky clubs in New York. 2000. And then uh, I think I kept my apartment in San Francisco the whole time. I sublet it or I, 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 had, it, I, I had it empty or I paid two rents. I had a rent controlled apartment. Uh, I'm not in it now. <clears throat> but um, uh, yeah, so I always had San Francisco as a, uh, you know, a safety if things didn't work out. The base. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, why did you land in San Francisco? Um, over and above anywhere else? Oh, uh, that was because um, my girlfriend at the time wanted to go to San Francisco. Mm -hmm. And uh, my parents, I was uh, 19, as I didn't finish college, my parents, uh, so this girlfriend and I, uh, we were, she was spending the summer with me. Uh, in my, my, my parents were divorced, so I would be with my father uh, for vacations, and he always was like, he didn't pay too much attention to what I was doing. Um, so that's when I had really fun, you know, I had fun in, in Manhattan. And, um, and she was staying with me, but I had a single bed. Uh, 
Um, and I think, you know, my, my, my father caught on. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just say caught on. Caught on. I got it. <laughs> <laughs> And, uh, and then he, you know, he connected with my mom and then I realized, oh my God, they're both like, like really being scary homophobic right now. Mm. And so she was, she was going to uh, the West Coast anyways. I went, I think I just hung around New York for a little while and then she was done with school and then we just drove out to California, San Francisco. I don't know exactly why she was going to San Francisco, but I knew that I had read all about like how cool San Francisco was in magazines. And, uh, and I knew that you could get marijuana all the time and it was good. So I wanted to go there and just get high all the time and, you know, have my girlfriend. I didn't even know it was gay. Mm. I went for the weed. <laughs> you went for the weed. And did and, you stay uh, yeah. for the weed? I mean, because, because then you, then you, came back after all these years what if it, oh. what about san francisco draws you back every time okay so I, I i went for the weed i didn't know too much about it and then i was you know and i thought people were just like hippies and doing hippie things and white guys playing drums uh but but then i you know i found this amazing counterculture artist scene and you know this is of course before the uh, uh the dot-com boom and all this and, pe and all the artists were pushed out to the east bay but san francisco rent was affordable and people were doing really cool things there were lots of queer people there were lots of um working class communities people of color um so it was it was fantastic and so uh so and that really kind of still lasted into the, you know, the two, 2000s a little bit. You know, I saw it was changing, but I never thought it would change, you know, to, to what it is now. So, so that's why I kept coming back, you know, from, from the 90s when I started going to New York, 2000s. I had an apartment in Williamsburg from, I think, 2000 to 2006. And then I moved back because uh, actually I got ill. I had this, this weird uh, vertigo, uh, which might be sort of menopause related. I don't know, because I didn't really get any of that too much. But I got this, this uh, vertigo that sent me to the hospital uh, for a while. And, uh, and also I met this, I had this girlfriend and I was really like, totally crazy about her. And she lived in the Bay area and I just wanted to be where she was. Plus I still had my apartment. So, uh, Oh, and also when I got sick, um, I, I had my first New York ambulance ride and I just thought if I ever get sick again, I wanted to be in San Francisco. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's New York ambulance is Tony Bennett song. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> I want to be sick in San Francisco. Yeah. And I was wondering if you have seen a difference both in this pandemic and also in the eighties with AIDS and HIV and being a comic at that time. Um, what was that like in terms of do doing comedy? I, uh, thank you. Thank you for asking that, Nina. I should have actually touched upon that when I talked about Valencia Rose, because that was also the reason uh, that we were uh, activated uh, to create a space, not just for, um, you know, cool cabaret and jokes, but also to merge activism and comedy and performance. The comedy that came out of uh, the gay community uh, in, the, in the 80s, uh, in the dawn of AIDS, uh, and also um, the response to the murder of uh, Moscone and Milk, to the murder of Milk, to the, uh, to the first time that we, we understood that the police are not our defenders and can be our attackers, that the police need to be held accountable. When the police came into the Castro and, and, and destroyed and, and went into where uh, a place called the Elephant Walk, which is called the uh, Harvey's now, and just, just tore it apart and beat the shit out of people, just whoever they saw as a response to the fact that when uh, 
Dan White was, I can't remember, I think there was some trial, and now I, I forget, but when the cop cars were burnt by the gay community and our allies and the activists on the street, the police the next day came and just beat the shit out of whoever, whoever was on Castro Street. Um, so this was where our, you know, this was where our comedy was coming from. In the, uh, now, the comedy that comes out of the pandemic, which we are, so far, we're lucky enough to watch on, online, is it, is it fueled by the anger and the activism and the politics? It's, it's fueled by, uh, you know, fear. And, and there are political uh, comedians. In fact, uh, uh, Betsy Salkind is going to be in the, in, in, in the show that's coming up. And, and we, you know, we kind of need that. And, and, you know, Will Durst is unfortunately, you know, out of commission for, for a while and sending uh, love to Will Durst, who is one of uh, the Bay Area and, and the country's most important political uh, minds. Um, so the comedy then, oh my gosh, Nina, it was just so different. It came from anger. It came from relevance. It had to be relevant. And there was so much that we were reacting against because we were also reacting against the uh, religious right who are bad but also hilarious. They're, they're such goofy. It, you know, and they weren't as scary as the religious right today who, carry, who are allowed to carry weapons. Mm -hmm. You know, they, the ones back in the 80s were just, um, you know, poorly dressed and ugly and they had, you know, dumb uh, shows at 2, 2 a.m. Um, you know, I mean, they, I mean, of course, they were, you know, probably connected with the Klan and all that, but it wasn't, you know, we didn't know, and we, you know, and, and, you know, and, and they were killing gay people and all that, but, but not, you know, not, not what's going on now. Uh, so it was a real defiant comedy, and, and yet it, it was really funny, and the community was a lot of activists, and so this was, this was really medicinal to be able to just get in a room and laugh at the same things because you, humor, as you know, is, is a weapon. It's a tool and it is a weapon and it's medicine.